Hello everybody, a warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the place where we're diving into the deeper meaning of life and asking the big questions. My name is Janneke and today I have Elisa Medus on my show again. Elisa is the mother of Eric Medhus, who committed suicide in 2009. However, Elisa is still communicating with her son through various mediums. For instance, Jamie Butler, who I interviewed last year, and Kim Babcock, who I interviewed this year. Now, this all these conversations has resulted in a very popular blog called Channeling Eric, a YouTube channel, and also two books called My Son and the Afterlife and My Life After Death, which we will be speaking about today. Elisa, it's wonderful seeing you again. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me back, and I wanted you to know that there's not too many people who can pronounce my last name as beautifully as you can. <laughs> I love that. Not even too. me. Not even me. So we go. Yeah, you know, you're you're the name is Norwegian, so it's yeah. very natural for me. <laughs> and that's why I also feel a, a bit more connected to this because I know that Eric Eric's father was Norwegian and I know that you guys have been here many times. Which is and, nice. And to Eric think about. loved Norway. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. place. It is very beautiful. So the last time we really delved into actually your journey from a non-believer to a believer and also about um, what happened to Eric and why he committed suicide. And I can really recommend uh, to my viewers that you can watch my pre previous interview with Elisa either up here or, or up here in the eye. But today I would love to uh, start with hearing more about the Channeling Eric blog, Elisa, because... Uh, that has become huge and I'm wondering actually where that came from, how that all started. Well, my daughter, who happens to be very, very tech savvy and has a, a really keen sense of aesthetics, decided that I needed an outlet because, you know, I was grieving so deeply. She had created a, a, a blog for herself, a fashion and beauty blog called Pretty Shiny Sparkly, it's wonderful. And uh, she thought it would be a, a good place for me to vent my grief. And indeed, you know, I, for some reason, I, I just heal better when I help others. I, I think that's why I'm a, a physician too, you know. Um, helping others is my path to healing. And so I did share a lot of my grief. I provi provided a, a, you know, a, a place, a very loving, supported, uh, supportive place so that other people in pain could share their grief too. But then, you know, Eric started playing all sorts of pranks on us and manifesting and calling us on the telephone and doing all just crazy things. And so every time something like that happened, I would put that on the blog. And, uh, and then he starts pranking blog members all over the world and still does on, a, on an everyday basis. And, um, you know, it just, it just took off. It, it, it just surprised me. Now it's like 11,000 hits a day and... I just um, can't believe it because I'm just this little, still partially broken little old lady clanking away on her laptop, posting blogs, but there's this whole blogosphere out there that just, wow, it, it, it's just so big. And, and the Chelsea family, we're so loving and supportive and just wonderful. It's, along with Eric, is my life. But now, basically... The blog has been my way as a mother to contribute something to my dead son so that he can teach us and spread some insight, some spiritual insight, and give spiritual advice to people. And um, I want to do that. I'd do anything for Eric, and I wanted to do that for him. So how often do you speak to Eric? Is it like every day through a medium or is it like a few times a week? Because it seems like you're coming out with material all the time. Well, no, I talk uh, every other week to a medium. Uh, I, I Every other week? Yeah, no, every other week I speak to a, a medium. Kim Babcock is the one I'm using now. Jamie is rebranding herself. She's going into teaching, so she's really not doing any mediumship anymore. And then sometimes I use my dear uh, friend Robert. Um, every other week, so a couple times a month only, and uh, the rest of the time I channel him when I'm in the bathtub or on walks. But I don't use that material for the blog. Oh, so you have started channeling him? Yes, but poorly. 
But uh, you know, I've got a lot of monkeys in my brain, and they just won't. I try to, I try to channel, and then all of a sudden, did I turn the dishwasher on? Uh oh! Come on, focus, focus, focus. Okay, so you're opening more and more to this. That's very interesting to hear because I know that, you know, in the beginning you didn't get uh, or hear him or get him in. Yeah in that sense uh, it so it has really been a journey for you and that's really encouraging and inspiring for other people who are trying to open up to their loved ones that they can actually have communication themselves without needing to go to a medium or a spiritual translator you, know, you, you just hit on something very important i think this is what i have learned from eric's second eric's book because he wrote my D uh, life after death that book essentially healed me just transcribing it, you know. I didn't write it. I just typed down, typed out what he said. But I learned that the relationship never has to die. I mean, when we lose somebody, well, lose, really don't lose them. They're really the same. They just don't happen to have a body, and they're living in a parallel dimension that's kind of right on top of ours. And so there's really no reason to just bury them or put them in an urn and say, okay, I guess that's it. Uh, rest in peace. Um, that's not the case. That most most of them don't want that. They want you to continue to have a relationship with them, and there's no reason why you can't. Hmm. So, uh, did you feel that you had to change something within you, like um, uh, raise your frequency, for instance? Because I've learned mm. that we need to raise our frequency to be able to communicate, and then. Uh, that can be explained by going into the heart. Was that your yeah. journey? Well, that's a very good question too. And I don't know if we talked about this on the last interview, but uh, but yeah, you know, when when you're in deep grief, like a mother who lost a child is, you know, your energy vibration, the frequency. I mean, this is all physics goes way far down. Here's our little visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum and here's microwaves and, and infrared rays and all that. We're in this tiny, tiny sliver called the visible range. And when I was in deep grief, like anybody who'd be depressed, etc., the vibrational frequency goes all the way to the bottom. And here are spirits outside and you know above in the frequency uh, um, the, of the uh, visible range. And they had to really lower their energy to get all the way down to the bottom, you know. So I did have to think about jo joyful moments. Sometimes it helps to listen to your favorite stand-up comic. Um, just to, trying to look inside your heart and, and tweak your perspective to find happiness. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to figure this out in a way because uh, I feel like I'm a lot in my head and I want to be able to communicate myself. But yeah, it's this journey from here to here because I'm mm. not in a grief. You know, I, I feel like I'm a happy person, but it's still control from here. And I think that's where it all stops in a way. But it's the how. And Eric speaks about that too. Uh, which we will come back to in his new book. He write, he uh, speaks about that he needed to get into his heart as well, even in That's heaven. Right. That's yeah. right, getting to a heart-centered consciousness. That's absolutely right. And he teaches also that um, we, as human beings, are actually we are we are emotional beings, which means we are made of emotions, which is a type of energy. Um, everything is energy, actually. Matter, you... And um, that, you know, we make mistakes as human beings of thinking first and then feeling. So you, we have a thought and that provokes an emotion of some sort, whether it's fear or anger or joy or whatever. And then that elicits some sort of response or choice. What we really should be doing is reflecting and kind of, you know, uh, tap it into or check it in with our intuition, with our heart. How am I feeling? So have the emotion embrace it, and then let that produce the thought, and then let the thought produce a reaction. That's a better way of doing it. Yeah. Still, it's hard. It's hard, because I noticed that he wrote that, and I was wondering, is that uh, the way it is here on Earth, that we do have the thought first and then the feeling, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. We're just programmed to work that way, in a sense? That's right. And, you know, some people do feel first and think second. But okay. uh, but for most of us, that does not come naturally. Our, nat our nature 
is to feel first and think second. Hmm. But I, I don't know why. Maybe it's all the external, the, our external beacon, all the external messages in the media and this and that, the other thing, and, and, and uh, you know, judgment, outside judgment from parents and peers and teachers. Maybe that is what creates this think first and then ignore your feelings until you have to. Yeah. I think that's very interesting because I think it's a huge shift that uh, we need to practice because it can't be understood by the mind. It mm -hmm. needs to be experienced. And I think there are uh, there are so many... Um, um, if we're going to solve a problem, that's the solutions, like in that heart consciousness. Yeah. You know what? I think Eric said this. What I compare it to, you know, when you have a feeling that is much more rich in information, it's like seeing a picture instead of a little description in a paragraph. The thoughts are like a little description in text. A paragraph, I mean, an image, a beautiful image is much more information rich. And that's what the feeling uh, provides. Right. So uh, let's move into the second book. Because okay. the first book was more uh, you asking him questions. Mm -hmm. And the second book, he is um, writing from an I perspective. Like, mm -hmm. how was the process, first and for foremost, with the book? Like, did, oh, yeah. uh, was it Jamie that uh, said word for word what Eric said? Exactly. Now, I had to change maybe some flip-flopping between tenses. Or if the sentence structure was didn't make any sense, I'd have to like flip the verb. It's just minor edits, but otherwise it's just a exact transcription. So I'd have uh, much more often than than twice a, a month, but I'd have re regular sessions and uh, and let him speak. And uh, this book uh, w was it his uh, wish to have it uh, manifest? Yes, he said it's my turn, time to for me to share my journey. I shared. Mom, you shared yours. Time for me to share mine. And he won he really wanted to first of all make it clear that relationships can continue after death. Um but he wanted to demystify death. So many of us are afraid of death because it's just a big unknown. There's such mystery to it and you know, we tend to fear the unknown. But he describes everything from death all the way through what's going on with him in the present uh, terms. So in such a detailed way that it really kind of takes almost all the mystery out. So you, you know what you're in store for and it's not that bad. Yeah. Yeah. So let's delve into that because I love this topic okay. about the afterlife. Um, I think very many people are interested in hearing more about it. So mm -hmm. he, uh, first and foremost, he, when he uh, died, he kind of stayed uh, close to earth from what I understand. And he stayed very close to you. Um, and from what I understood, he, he had a, a long time adjusting to the afterlife in a way. He needed first and foremost to say goodbye to all of you. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if he was kind of, uh, because you hear of ghosts and people who are earthbound, you know, who mm -hmm. stays closely to their uh, work or their homes. They won't leave their homes. Was he kind of in a more dense uh, realm at that point? Well, he says that everybody, the way they cross over is different. Some people do, you know, go to their funeral and things like that before they cross over. Some immediately cross over to the afterlife, and it's usually based on whatever belief you had about it. Um, his belief was that he needed to say goodbye. It wasn't that, you know, something was wrong with him or he was confused, although he probably was a little bit confused. Um, but, uh, you know, he just had to, he had to, uh, prepare himself for the unknown after a crossover. Now, I will say one thing that I need to mention is that I tell you, when I had to transcribe his chapter on, on his death, Yannicka, that was so tough. I don't know if you've read it, but boy, yeah. I, there, there were so many times where I said, I cannot do this. I'm going to call the publishers and say, no, God, mm -mm, mm -mm. but, uh, so the, because there, there were things that I learned that I kind of wish I didn't know now. Uh, but uh, oh. I kept going because I knew it was important to Eric. And 
Exactly. So I, I just want people to know that this was not a piece of cake, this book. The goodbyes to the family, too. I don't know if you've read those, but they're very poignant. Most people cry when they read that session. They're, they're, it's bittersweet. It's you know, sad but sweet at the same time. Yeah, because it really describes each relationship to each person because he had many siblings and he really describes the details of like the energetic details of that relationship so you kind of get the feeling that you know every relationship is so important they're they're different there's not like you love this person more than that person it's just yeah. different and so meaningful and that gets you to think about your own relationships you know that everything brings you something unique. So that was really beautiful. Oh, that is well said. I never thought about that. And that's just oh. lovely. Yeah. That is lovely. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. And so you're saying that he crossed over. Does that mean that there's kind of three stages there, that you are on Earth, then you're dead, but you're Earthbound in a way, and then you cross over? That's what I understand. Of course, it complicates matters to know that there is no time there. So uh, we don't have linear time. Everything is happening all at once. So, you know, Eric's death, his crossing over, his funeral, all that, boom, in one moment. Yeah. So uh, eventually he did cross over or went to this more uh, heavenly realm. But first and foremost, he, he went to this dark place. Now, I found just, just the journey so interesting. And then he met this therapist or he had a life review, which was just incredible yeah. uh, to listen to because, you know, these life reviews, I've heard about it before, that you can experience everything in your whole life or you do and you you experience everything from everyone's perspective yeah emotionally with all the senses everything i it's so detailed he i think he writes in here that he even knew how many times that person had blinked or swallowed so uh it's amazing apparently yeah and what I uh, also uh, wonder about, because I would imagine that when I die, I would just quickly remember who I was. Like, oh, I'm back home. But it seems yeah. like you still need healing, life review, go through a lot. Like it took uh, Eric some time mm. to adjust to the spirit realm. And I somehow I was wondering about why that was, because to me, I sometimes feel like I'm more other places than here in a way that is more mm. natural to me. Too. Be. Yeah. yeah. So wouldn't you just click back in place and be like, yeah. not everybody. I mean, obviously some people do that, especially children. Yeah. You know, they haven't had as much time on earth. So it's almost like if they die when they're five or so, it's like going through a revolving door. So, oh, I'm back. Where's the party? Um, but, uh, but some, especially if they've had very traumatic deaths, as in the case of Eric, uh, it takes a little bit more orientation. And he had, um, you know, he had to deal with trying to find a way to forgive himself for taking his own life and for creating such pain for the rest of his family and his friends. And that, took right. some, that took some therapy. So it is really very different for each soul. And that's mm -hmm. why I think near-death experiences are very different. That's true. Yeah. There are elements that are the same, but there are elements that are quite different. Yeah. So what about different dimensions? What is your understanding of these dimensions? Like, I, I, I know that we can't understand it through the mind. I don't think we can, but uh, maybe we can simplify it a little bit. Well, uh, he tells us that there are infinite number of dimensions. That's hard to imagine because we can't under grasp the concept of infinity. And that these um, these dimensions are sort of mushed together and swirled into one another. Um, and there's no hierarchy like, oh, you're better if you're in dimension six. There's, there's not that going on. And there are also an uh, infinite number of, um, of uh, universes as well. Yes, and I wanted to ask you about that. Uh... When, when scientists are speaking about multiple universes, are they, you know, getting closer to what really is in Eric's point of view? I think so. I just saw yeah. a scientific paper 
about a year ago that, you know, so that scientists discovered that there are multiple dimensions and then, of course, multiple universes. There, were, there, there was a paper out about that, too. So, yeah, you know, science is finally bridging the gap. Science really did a lot of harm to spirituality at first because, well, it harmed me. I'll tell you that because as a physician, my education is science. You know, I, I tasted, breathed, smelled, heard, saw science in, in my life. And science taught me that if, if you can't perceive it with your senses or if you cannot measure it with an instrument, it didn't exist. Well, now, especially with the help of quantum physics, we're, we're beginning to, scientists are beginning to uh, understand things like what is the soul made of? How is it attached to the body? Are there different dimensions? Are there different universes and so on? So we're getting there. Yeah. But so what is your take on that? There's different universes, like everything we're talking about here, Eric, you know, in the afterlife and everything and we and is that one universe? And then there's just a million other universes that we don't know anything about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I go over there, I'm going to get my passport, <laughs> my little spirit passport, take Eric's hand, say, come on, let's go to universe XYZ. Can we can we travel there to other universes? Oh, sure. Yeah. And Eric in the blog talks a lot about uh, his travels to other dimensions, seeing other dimensional beings and different universes and so on. So really, the possibilities are limitless. They really are. If you can think it. It can, it, it will happen. So the afterlife for us is kind of, um, we're talking about the afterlife in this, for this planet and for this universe, but not all others. <laughs> no, no, the, the, the afterlife is the afterlife. Oh, okay. For, for everyone, everyone. Okay. for every okay. alien, another planet, etc. Oh, okay. that's where God source hangs out although it's really I don't have the we don't have the human vocabulary to describe it because there's not a location just like there's not a time sequence so uh, but that's where God source fractures itself off into these little souls to experience the human experience to get to know itself experientially not just conceptually so that's the that's the God's hangout place that's where he chills and has a beer Okay, so it's kind of closer to source. And uh, from what I understand, he has also an experience, Eric has an experience of God. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about how he experienced God? Well, apparently first he w did, sort of wanted to skirt under the radar because he, did, he, he, he thought, oh, God is probably going to be pissed off at me because, you know, I took my life. But, uh, you know, his life in the afterlife, was doing so well. He, he had finished his therapy. He was just so happy. He had explored so, so many parts of the afterlife. But there was still one thing that he couldn't change. And that was the, our pain. You know, being acutely aware of the atom bomb he set off in our hearts, in our lives. And uh, so he called upon God. And God entered. And I can't remember what God looked like, but I, I remember that whatever you want or need God to look like, that's where, how it, she, he, it's genderless, will appear. If you want it to appear as a telephone, it'll appear as a telephone. Hello, God. So, um, uh, you know, and, and he, God helped him understand um, his spiritual contract and the fact that we were going to have to go through our healing in our own time and, and so on. So it helped him a lot. Hmm. Wonderful. And I think there's a video about that on your YouTube yes. chan channel. There's a video on just about everything. In yeah. fact, we, he brought Bigfoot in to, to be channeled and there actually is Bigfoot. It's really cool because they are actually multidimensional beings. And the re reason we can't find them is because they're able to just quickly just go into another dimension so that they can't be seen. So they can, they're trans-dimensional, uh, basically. Hmm. So back a little bit back to the dimensions, because from what I understand, we're three D dimensional or four D, mm -hmm. and then uh, a lot of people are saying that we're moving into f the fifth dimension, the more heart space, mm. the astral, 
And what is your perspective on, you know, the astral plane and the dream state? Do you think that that's the place we go when we dream and that we can meet spirits there that kind of Eric can meet us in the fifth dimension, for instance? Hmm. Another very good question. Yes. And, I, you know, I've had lucid dreams of Eric. Uh, and that, that's those are the moments when my soul leaves my body to a certain degree you still are attached to it you had not cut off completely otherwise you'd be dead and um and lucid dreams differ in that you can vividly remember them and they're very sensory you really know the the, the visuals in such detail and even the smells and everything it's just so concrete it seems like it's real and in a way it is just another reality you're in together with Eric I was in my dream in another reality with Eric and that Eric that reality was on the astral plane mm. but he is at he's residing now at a even higher plane right than yes. the astral yeah, yeah from what I understand yeah because I do believe that there are some parts of souls that are lingering in the astral mm. yeah so uh in his healing he went through um hearing about his past lives and I, I gotta say past lives because you know now we're speaking about there's no such thing as time yeah. so I guess this parallel lives but mm. he he was a butterfly and I was like that's right really that's right I, I you know can we really go into that small perspective yeah but absolutely was that we could be any life form you know a soul is a soul and a soul can become any kind of life form at once um so yeah he in in that life he really cherished that life because he was able to transform himself in a way that he really couldn't when he was eric on earth yeah i mean um uh, i can imagine that uh, but did his kind of whole consciousness go into that or is it was it kind of parts of his consciousness that I'm just wondering about. Oh this. no, it's it's the entire consciousness. Okay. You, you, if if I were to see your, from if I was able to see your soul, it'd be much bigger than your body. So it doesn't have to like cram into like like you're putting on skinny jeans, you know. I'm like, get my soul in that butterfly, dang it. Uh, it's not like that. Sorry about the Texas twang, guys. <laughs> I can't take the Texas out of this girl. So you know, each creature on this earth has then a soul. That's right. Yeah. Not just consciousness. Yeah. It has a soul. Like everything has a soul. That's right. And that's why when vegans fuss at those who eat meat, uh, Eric has to explain to them that uh, what's to say that the, 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 the soul of, you know, a head of lettuce is not more valued hmm. than the soul in a cow. Or finish it, yeah. <laughs> you know, lamb. Pinochet. So uh, it is, and the, the thing is, you have to raise and kill and eat with respect and gratitude, and then it's okay. They the, the plants and, and 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 animals they have contracts with us to be eaten. So. Oh, there was one uh, of my viewers who asked this very question and I didn't have time to ask him this question. So I, she was wondering about just that, if it's okay to eat meat uh, and if they do some, at some level, if they have accepted this, like agreed to this. Okay. Yeah, they have. Okay. But again, we need to raise them and slaughter them with respect and we need to say thanks. Yeah, for what we're ingesting and what's nourishing our bodies. So animals, do they go to the same place as we do when we die? Yes. Did you get to the point uh, where uh, the uh, where the insect portal was? Yes. <laughs> that was pretty cool. A lot of spirits like to hang out at the insect portal. That's the portal that all the insects come in. Think about the millions of mosquitoes that pour into heaven. And uh, it's like a fireworks display because they spark, like beautiful light energies that spark, 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 spark. <laughs> uh, and, and it's just apparently beautiful to witness. Yeah. Uh, they come in sort of organically, insects do. They just get out of their body and flow right into the afterlife because they don't have this belief system. Okay, you know, 
I'm going to die, I leave my body, I cross over, I go greet Jesus, and blah, 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 blah. So they don't have these preconceived notions. Hmm. And when it comes to how it looks like in heaven, it seems like, you know, they have the same stuff as we have here, just more and much, much, much more and more brilliant and shiny and everything. Like even colors, I understand, is three-dimensional mm. and even more beautiful. And also you can create what you're thinking about. And uh, I understood that Eric wanted to be, you know, he was still attached a little bit to his uh, human form form or human perspective so he needed to manifest a house and i'm trying to picture this and i can't like i can't picture a house in heaven like how solid is it do you have an understanding of kind of um how it feels of the physicality or the not i mean it's not physical but it's still s solid it seems like you can make it as solid as you want and for example my iphone Really, this is not solid. There is more empty space between the molecules than there are. And if we didn't have, if I truly did not have this preconceived notion that this is solid and I can't poke my finger through, if I didn't have that preconceived notion, I'd be able to do it. There should be nothing to stop me. So uh, physicality is a perspective thing to a certain degree, how solid something feels. Yeah. And Eric had a little trouble with the stop, he calls it the stop mechanism. After he left his body, one of the things that alarmed him the most, besides seeing what he had done, was uh, just trying to touch his face and his hand went right through it. You know, it didn't stop and he tried to grab the gun and it just went right through. So he missed that and he had to learn later how to recreate it, but he missed that, that solid touch. But now... He's able to move physical things, or is he? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, he's done it. He does it all the time. Really? It's it's amazing. And he makes things appear. Kim, who you interviewed, of course, uh, the other day, she and her little seven-year-old daughter were looking for this little bag of chocolate candies. It's her she kisses. They were looking everywhere. They had lost it, kind of upsetting, because they just had it. And all of a sudden, bring, it appears right in front of their faces and then falls to the floor. So he can make things disappear and manifest. For me, he's, I've been at a restaurant, for example, and he'd take the, the salt and pepper shakers and slowly slide them to the edge and off the table. You've he put seen it back that? on, slowly, oh yeah. And he's done this for a lot of the blog members. He, he moves things all the time. You can watch him move deadbolts. You can watch him turn handles all the way on. Uh, the sound uh, is uh, making some noise now. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. Okay. Uh, How's that? No, it's a little bit uh, noisy now. I don't well, know. Do you want me to take out my uh, earphone and plug it back in? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it just turned really weird. Well, we're talking about all the stuff that Derek does, so it might be him. Eric, stop it. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, he's pulling a lot of pranks on people. And, and I was getting that um, thought of that film Ghosts, you know? Have you seen it with Demi Moore? Oh, sure. Yeah. Is it kind yeah. of like that, that that ghost, you know, has to really have the intention to hit something and then all of a sudden he manages to hit something physical? That's, that's what it is. It's all about yeah. focused intent. Right. That thought that you want to have create that reality. The thought has to be very focused. Yeah, and I understand also that it is important that we do work on like issues here on earth because we will carry them over to the other side because mm. thoughts creates things. Mm -hmm. So if we, you know, can't really control our minds, that, that will uh, create itself much quicker in the afterlife. So mm. uh, you yeah, so I guess, you know, if you if you have very many negative thoughts, that is what you will create still. That's yeah. right, but negative thoughts are different. They're negative emotions. Okay. <clears throat> They're more disconnected from them. They have this more of an objective um, perspective. They, they can't hold on to emotions like resentment, for example, 
okay. it's just it's too difficult. That energy is just too dense, and they just can't physically grab a hold of it for very long. Right, but I guess that's in the dimension that he's in now. Exactly. Okay, like in yes. the lower ones, we can yeah. probably have those negative energies around us so exactly that's what what i've come to is that it is important that i work on myself because i don't want to carry all that stuff and then manifest that stuff in the spiritual realm and then use a lot of time to get you know to a higher place that's that's true the same the same that's a good theory the same thing holds with people who take their lives you know they that's a, temp- a permanent solution to a temporary problem take your life you're taking your life because you're upset with somebody and or, or that you, you just feel lost or, or whatever yeah. um, be- because you realize that you take those problems with you after you die and in fact you create more for yourself because you're painfully aware of all the grief you've left in your wake and it could be excruciating so a lot of spirits do cross over uh, and think, gosh, why didn't I just stick with it? The human experience is, the, you know, the the uh, the it's a treasure to incarnate and work on uh, these these things, these often painful uh, this painful ballet of dualities. Um, so yeah, when yeah. you cross over what you uh, what you didn't like before, because life is hard sometimes, you treasure. Yeah. And he has got a girlfriend. Yeah. That's so sweet. Finally. I think he had two or three in his life, but they were never very, they didn't last very long. But, but yeah, Jillian. Yeah, that's so sweet. So how does that work in heaven? Well, uh, you just uh, find somebody who has the same, um, I guess. Is it a soulmate or a twin soul or something like that? It can be. It it doesn't have to be. Okay. At all. But uh, they are soulmates. Uh, She, I think she drowned when she was young, uh, 20 or something. But they've been together for a long time. And um, they teach each other. And I, I think part of the pairing, you know, between souls has to do with what can you offer me as far as, you know, helping my, my spirit evolve. Okay. And so there's a bit of that. Yeah. Because, uh, like, but she, he never brings her over for dinner. You know, <laughs> what, what, what's the deal, Eric? <laughs> They're never getting married. We want to be there. <laughs> yeah. They're living in sin. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, I mean, uh, there's no, permanent thing there in a way that uh if they would (laughs) i'm just curious what if they want to move on i guess that's not a conflict that they're not oh they can but again there's that whole timelessness thing that makes it very difficult to yeah to to conceive of those kind of uh concepts yeah i just found that interesting because he said that they still have you know that physical intimacy that we do Mm -hmm. as well just in a totally different way and uh, I guess I hadn't thought of that but for those who have, are single like that's a relief that maybe if you don't meet your soul partner here you can meet them in the afterlife there we go yeah so I interviewed uh, Kim uh, last week I think and and I've also interviewed uh, Jamie Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting because they had very different approaches Mm -hmm. to uh, communicating with Eric. And I was wondering about your thoughts on that, because in my interview with Jamie, he was very like, I just felt like he was very like foolish and and fun. And he was Mm -hmm. like almost flirting with me. And then he probably was. Yeah. (laughs) And you're pretty. So I know that. Yeah, it was very much fun. But in this interview, he was more uh, like serious and uh, he didn't have that tone at all. And and the last time I asked if he could say something about me that will that uh, would validate the experience for me, because, you know, I have a skeptical mind and it's always good to have that validation. And I asked this time and then he seemed like he was irritated or at least um, uh, Kim said that. But I found that a bit weird because last time he was not. So- well, I think he has grown. Uh, he's grown up a little bit. And um, he even said at one point that he had outgrown Jamie 
um, oh. in a way. He doesn't curse as much. He still curses. And, uh, you know, there are definitely times with Kim that he's just that same way, just acting crazy, making us all laugh, etc. But, you know, he does have more serious moments because he takes his job uh, imparting this information very seriously. I see. So he has changed in a way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Well, you never take the, all the Eric out of Eric instead of Eric, though. He'll always be yeah. a bit of a prankster. But with, uh, with Jamie, it was, she was like a big sister to Pester, yeah. you know. And, and Kim, they're more like friends, respected okay. colleagues in a way. And, uh, but he doesn't give her as hard a time as he did uh, Jamie, to tell you the truth. Okay, but do you take word for word as true? Because I think there's always like a color of the medium, like the person, that nothing can be 100% clear. Oh no, of course not. We're humans. Mediums are humans. They're going to have their filters. For some reason, Eric is particularly good at keeping a medium's filters down. You know, he helps make them clear. And I could see him working with the kid because she gets she has gotten better and better over time. Okay. Um, but yeah, there nothing is a hundred percent. No medium is a hundred percent accurate. Yeah, and you've been working a lot with finding those too. Yeah, they right. are hard to find. Oh, girl, I have been through some ones that are not good at all. It's okay. very difficult to find um, a, a very gifted, accurate medium. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's so fascinating. They're just talking. It's just coming so fast. Yeah, what, what they both do is they, they, it just sort of bypasses their brain. When Eric says something, they don't think about it and then translate. It just almost like moves right through their mouth. And, okay. uh, and you ask him, what, what did Eric just say? I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Elisa. I have to mention that uh, a week ago, bef no, a week before the interview with Kim, I had a dream where I heard, hello, Yannicka, this is oh. Eric or something like that. Oh, and I just remember it was very short, but it was just a hello. Yeah, that's, that's nice. nice. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have an EVP. Maybe he'll leave his his uh, his voice on this recording. He has done it many times before. I know. I think he did that in our last interview. I didn't oh, he hear did? it though. Yes, you. Oh. Uh, you wrote. Oh, me that's and, right. I remember. Yeah. But sometimes I didn't hear it's it. But really loud, like uh, one with with Jamie. 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 Uh, you could hear him shouting "Minions!" really loudly. I mean, no mistake. And obviously, did not hear it in the live interview. And then right away, Jamie said he's calling the minions. So it's oh. quite amazing. I mean, I I don't know what skeptic could listen to that and not believe that there is cons consciousness survival after death. Yeah, there are some proofs there, actually. There are some evidence that I, I hope that uh, more people will look into because, uh, w yeah, there are, they are there. Yeah. We just need to have a curiosity from the people who have the ability to get this more out, actually. That's true. That's so, true. Thank you so much, Elisa. What what have you coming up now um, with channeling Eric? You you have some workshops, right, coming up? Well, we have a radio show we just started, and I oh. posted that on the blog. And it's every Thursday at uh, 7 p.m. Central Time. It's one where people call in and ask Eric questions. He might oh. teach a little bit of something at first, but home oh, the first one had some technical glitches. Uh, the learning curve, but uh, it's very powerful. Lots of tears. Lots of Wow's! Uh, it was just an amazing uh, show, and we're having our next one, our second one, Thursday. And then, starting in June, we start. Eric wanted to go on a uh, multi-city tour, so wow. we're going to take him and trans-channel him, and he's going to be teaching things, etc. Denver, then New York, Chicago, Vancouver, Sedona. I think. Let's see, Orlando. Um, um, San Diego, Austin, I don't know, there are eight cities, so that should be fun, yeah. one city a month. And hopefully you can come to Norway one day. I will. Are you in you Oslo? Will? Yes. Yes, well, I don't know if I'll bring Channeling Eric, with, but yeah, you know, we we have a little hütte right uh, in the Hallingdal Valley near Yailo. 
Right. You know what that is? Yes, I do. Yeah. It's called yeah. Hul. Yeah. H-O-L. Little bitty town. More sheep than people there. Wonderful. But it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Well, maybe you can meet and maybe one day you can bring channeling Eric here. There we go. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. Yes. Thank you so much, Elisa. And uh, good luck with the, everything you're doing. You're doing some wonderful work for people. So and thank so you. are you. And I really appreciate that. You're really helping spirituality along. You're really opening up some minds and hearts. And I'm very, very, very grateful for that. Thank you. That was nice. And thank you for watching, guys. And remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't before. And you can also follow, follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Much light. Bye-bye.